So your high school career finishes, and uh, I see that at that time, if you were in the Detroit Public Schools, you graduated in the winter. So you started Michigan in December of 51, and that was a really cool year for you. As, as I read, you got to go to Buenos Aires and swim in the Pan American Games, and you won medals there, and certainly that was a, an interesting story. I, I read that things did not always go so well on that trip, that that, that was a challenging trip, but it was still a, an experience for you. Well, it was a remarkable time. <clears throat> we were bussed around, and I remember those many times people in those quadrants had never seen swimming races, or if they had, they didn't know who they were. Uh, and they were the ones who did were actually some quite very good, but you didn't know because you'd never seen them before. Uh, and we never had a place to say it was worth their darn, and we didn't have food that was anywhere there. And it was a, a little bit difficult because I think there was a lot of, a lot of guys, there were more identity going on seeing the, the nightlife than it was going the, the, the things that were there. But it was- I mean, can we give them a break though, Bumpy? I mean, to be dropped in Buenos Aires as a young man in 1951, I'm sure that was pretty challenging to not want to tap into the nightlife there for a night or two, no? <clears throat> it was an, a remarkable experience and uh, truly remarkable. Uh, and remarkable, as far as I can remember, everybody stayed healthy. There were nobody saying, uh, we had plenty of times to, 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 be, <laughs> to not be as good as ill. Uh, and we had, remember, that was right. In the Hague, to ten of the people who lived there uh, had a superb exposure and uh, giving. I can remember standing in on the Olymp Olympic tire and asking a guy, a guy where there was another. Met from Michigan, and I in the same field, and the guy came along. The cargo came out, and his uh, to and to hurry up, hurry up, and get up to the starting line. Well, he couldn't. I couldn't know. Didn't know what he's what he was talking about because he didn't hit any. Didn't, uh, and and kind of the guy had to keep leaving his perch on the uh, high lure to come down to get us, to give us the, the Americans to play it. when the gun goes off, go. And that was all, that was nothing else to know because you never gotten much, much parts of that line. Uh, but in those That's days- That's the international language for swimming, right? When the gun <laughs> goes off, go. Uh, and, That's pretty good. Uh, so another thing that happened in 1951, and again, like Bumpy, this is a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you because in reading your about your career, not only do you have the opportunity to swim for Matt Mann, who, you know, I listened to Doug Webster, a 1966 graduate speak the other day, and you know, he talks about Matt Mann as a predecessor to Doc Councilman, as one of the great college swimming minds and American swimming minds there was. And you were blessed to have the opportunity to swim with um, a second amazing coach and legendary coach. So in 1951, uh, if I can kind of summarize your story to pass it over to you, um, I, I gathered that you kind of felt like you needed a little bit more in your training to go to the next level if you were going to try and swim at the 1952 Olympics. And so rather than train in Ann Arbor, uh, you chose to go to Yale 
uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, and swam with the legendary coach Robert Kibhuth, who was uh, coaching there. Uh, and for those who may not know, this is a coach that introduced a number of new principles, including interval training and just uh, some of the things that are widely accepted today uh, that were not at that time and uh, weight training, uh, things that were not done. And so that was the lure for you to go there and to try to train at a really high le level with him. Can you tell me about that time swimming with him, your memories of of Coach Kiputh and and what you got from that experience going to Yale in the summers? I think that he's most, the most expect man I've ever known. Uh, he was a delightful person. And the first day I was there at Yale, I stayed in the, with all the other swimmers there. And then they would, uh, he would somehow get with you the first day or two and wanted to, wanted to know what you were doing in, in school, what do you want to be, be and so forth. Uh, he was a delightful man. And there were no other places to do this. He would, you were to be reading your own books and uh, waiting or getting figuring out how to find a some place to, to swim, swim and get get water to boot. Uh, and he, but he was a delightful man because he was working for Michigan players, uh, who Michigan used to go. Home in the, in the, in the summers, but these this were the things they did when uh, Yale did first, is they did this, and uh, they had really way away ahead of the rest of the people, and, and training, and other such things, and it couldn't have been nicer to me, uh, even though I was, I, but. It, well, Junkin from way away from, from Yale, uh, it was a phenomenal place to be. And uh, I went there for the second summer. I spent two different summers. I can remember I ran in that it was a, a, dunder, a wonderful place because there was nothing else to do there to swim, and then you can find a book to read, and then we would start at eight o'clock in the morning. In the morning, and we just and uh, he, uh, it was, and he was, he was the Olympic coach at the time, so therefore, he, the, that fed us right right into the Olympic trials. Uh, which I, I mean very carefully uh, and that day uh, and he was a even though as a coach he didn't have to do it he was a delightful man and uh, a man to, to swim under you mentioned that you know there was something else to do at Yale but swim and read a book, and I, I gathered that if you needed a book, you didn't have to go any further than Coach Kiputh's office. When I went to his office the first night, he he had a huge office. Every book, book imaginable was there, and he asked what I was taking in college, and I went at the time I was not sure what I was taking, and he said here. To the say, and he then waved his arms around, came out, and I came out with about ten or, or more. Big baby food said, "Here, you got time to do some, and do this." And uh, it was a, I probably read more important, but how to, how how this was done or that was done. Uh, a delightful man. I followed him for many, many years, and through the Olympic years, uh, and his 
as when he was even was retiring. Uh, he was just a delightful person. Bumpy, you know, one thing that seems obvious to me is that there's probably a degree of your fame that you were deserved of that was taken from you, not only in your inability to participate at the high school state meet and, you know, set records and do things that you should have been allowed to do, but then if I can teach another little swimming lesson to some of the listeners that, or readers that might ever, you know, see some of this stuff, you're at a, you're at a time right before the sport changes. The, la the, ne the 1956 Olympics, the individual medleys are recognized by FINA, world records are recognized, uh, but they are in 52. And so as you're coming through your senior year of high school and freshman year of college and sophomore year, and the years that we're talking about right here, the year training with both Matt Mann and Robert Kiputh, you are widely recognized as the best individual medley swimmer in the world. You are breaking 400 IM world records repeatedly during this time. But unfortunately for you, the individual, I'm sorry, I said 400, 300 meter individual medley world records, you're breaking world records, but these events are not recognized by FINA and not presented in the Olympics. And one of the things that I read in something that you wrote is that that stung for you. Obviously the opportunity to represent the United States in what you were probably better than anyone else in the world at, at that time, that wasn't available to you. And I read that that's something that still sticks with you to this day. Obviously this was a, a, t a difficult thing for you. Can I hear you talk about that a little bit? Well, I can. Uh... John Davies is his name, and John. And he yeah. went with you to Yale, didn't he? He 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 was a Michigan swimmer. Is that correct? That he was a Michigan swimmer, and he went with you in those summers to Yale to train. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm I've got to know we were good friends. I was best man at his wedding a few years later, and. Uh, we actually room room together back at Michigan one year uh, after that, uh, and he's been now he's been as a go in in California the last thirty or forty years, and he's still there. I judge know. Judge John now, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you have loved to have swum the 300 meter individual medley for the United States at the 1952 Olympics? Sure, I would have loved to have tried. But throughout the course of, of people making rules, and invariably the people who are making the rules have done the least of their own to know what the hell they're talking about. So you really, you to kind of take it after on the chin after a while. Uh, but uh, sometimes you're, you're fond of them and sometimes you just wonder why, how he kept his, what he's doing. Well, Bumpy, I just want you to know that I found your story and I found your story to be amazing. Um, one of the th articles that I wanted to tell you about that I that I read was, um, you know, maybe about 10 years after you graduated high school, I, I was searching for Bumpy Jones articles and one hit, and it wasn't about you, it was about someone they were comparing you to. And the headline on the article said, best since Bumpy. And I think that that's really a statement of how special somebody was that 10 years, 15 years after they've come and passed by, that they're still trying to figure out who the next Bumpy was going to be. And uh, I don't want to insult that young swimmer, uh, but he was not you. 
And uh, based on what I've read about, there really was not another you that came along for a long time. And um, in my book, when I eventually get a chance to write it, I am going to make sure that people who never heard of you are going to recognize that you, by any standard, it's really hard to say anyone is the best, right? You become the best of your time, and eventually you collect all of those people who were the best at their individual time. And I don't know how you separate those people, but you were the best of your time uh, to come along in, from the state of Michigan. And I will make sure that your story is told and in any book that I ever put together. Um, and that people, people understand that, you know, not only did you accomplish great things, but as we talked about today, that you would have accomplished even more had some really silly rules not been in place. And had honestly, had you just come along probably four years later, you, you might have you been swimming in those 1956 Olympics and representing the United States in your best event. And, um, even though you didn't do everything that I think that you were absolutely capable of being allowed to do, you did everything you were capable of doing. And you pursued the opportunities to get better. I love your story that you made an assessment in your life that to go to the next level, you needed to go find that next level and that you went to Yale and did that and became the best in the world at what you did. And uh, I just, uh, I really appreciate you giving me an hour of your time today um, and, and talking to me about some of these experiences. The, the Obviously the big one that I didn't get to um, was, was just 1952. Um, and I know going to the Helsinki Olympics must have been an amazing experience for you. I know you got to swim in the preliminaries of the 800 freestyle relay, but um, they did not award a medal uh, to alternates at that time. Current swimmers now get that medal, but you did not. I mean, just kind of for me, continuing that story of things that, you know, like should have happened for you that didn't quite happen. But if I finish there with your, your memories of, of those 52 Olympics, what comes to mind when you think back to that experience? Uh, probably too many things. Uh, I, I have some, some of the smart, smartest people I've known and a few of the dumbest, but there, there's some remarkably good, good people I show you uh, before I let you go, there was something I, I wanted to show you that I came across. Uh, on my screen. Do you see that picture? Oh, yeah. How, how great is that picture? I think we have it. I don't know, Maria. Uh, but that was from one of the newspapers. I'm sure if you if you keep clippings that you had that picture and I found another great one I wanted to see there. This was another one from the from the Detroit papers. It was just a headshot that I found it in the papers, but I'm sure you guys have these pictures from scrapbooks, but who's that guy, Bumpy? <laughs> you had hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it brings back a lot of my life. Uh, and. I, whatever did, did the, uh, the number of people I worked for or were I worked with well, were truly, uh, I think I was very lucky to have a high school coach who was not was a swimming coach at all, never pretended to be a coach, but he, he studied up and he started walking the, the walking up and down and without, we didn't have rooms at the time. He would just give me my step as we worked along 
And he was way ahead of them. People didn't do that in those days. Uh, but we did. And, uh, and you're, of course, talking about Dick Stuckey right now, right? Correctly. And I love this quote that I had from him uh, that I had jotted down in some notes here that people might have been reading. I've had Bumpy for two years now, and even I won't guess what he can do. He figured out he figured out pretty quickly that uh, you you would surprise him. I assume well, he was <coughs> as important to me as anybody in the world. Uh, he was a well well trained local coach, and <coughs> I even didn't realize probably. After knowing him a couple of years, that he used to be, that he had other other things, because he was so busy with the, the swimmers, and uh, but he, he he like many people at s schools in those days, he he did what he was told. Uh, Mark, in your uh, discoveries in that. Did you come across the first issue of Sports Illustrated? I have seen the first issue of Sports Illustrated in 1960. Yeah. Tell me about what I should be looking for in there. I actually just well, looked through it. It's about a 35 page issue. I was just well, looking at it. Page. it er, there's an article in there that on him in the okay. first issue of Sports Illustrated. And you, I, I read that you really didn't swim too much for, for a while there, Bumpy, before you came back to master swimming and set all these world records. You, you kind of stopped swimming for a little while. And if it weren't for the kind of the creation of master swimming in 1971, I don't know if you would have come back to it, but you had a reason to once there were meets and, and all that. But you you came back to swimming in your later years and stuck what with it and into your 80s, continuing to break world records, right? When you turned 80, it, as recently as 2013, you were breaking world records. Well, I, there's been a lot of changes in my life. Uh, I've, I've, had, I've had a wonderful experience with raising a large family of kids and a wife who is very uh, excited to, to know that I was trying to do something that had rarely been done. Very few people ever swam after college and I swam, swam a number of years after college. Uh, and whenever I could, uh, still and enjoy that part. And uh, when it's gone, it's gone. And there are lots of young kids today that are so good that it's truly remarkable what they can do. So it's uh, you have to live in your own world. <laughs>